Okay, good evening from London, everyone. Um, welcome to the next in our series of webinars, which is on the old vines of Barossa. Uh, so my name is Julia Lambeth. I'm one of the educators at WSET School London um, and have been working on several of these webinars over the last uh, well, couple of months now that we've been doing uh, while lockdown is in place and while we're not able to do the series of events that we would normally have in place in school. Um, so while it's been um, a strange time, um, these webinars have actually been a really nice thing to do. It's allowed us to reach more people um, and allowed us to uh, do things in a slightly different way. So I hope you've been enjoying them as much as we have. Um, so the subject of tonight is the old vines of Barossa. Um, and just to explain a little bit of the reason behind this, it was, um, it was a personal choice for me uh, based on a trip I had to Australia um, a couple of years ago now. I, um, <laughs> I was actually uh, lucky enough to win a blind tasting competition uh, put on by Wines of Australia and the prize was um, a two week wine tasting tour in Australia. Um, I'm going to tell you it's the best thing I've ever won. Uh, and as a result of that, um, a part of the trip was in Barossa where we were able to um, taste a lot of the wines, meet a lot of the producers and get a real understanding of the old wines that they have there. So that's why the focus um, is Barossa tonight, but by no means is this the only place that has very old vines. So I will um, touch on a couple of places in Australia and at the end I've got a couple of resources um, in for other countries as well that you might be interested in. Um, so yeah, more, more of a personal connection here. Um, so what I'm going to be looking at as part of the webinar is um, a little bit of an overview of what an old vine is um, and then looking at Australia a little bit more generally to start off with in terms of its history and then focusing in on Barossa, um, their history and the collection of old vines which survives to this day. So I hope you will all find it as interesting as I did. Okay. Um, so first off, just so you are all um, on the same page in terms of where we are, um, we're of course talking about Barossa in Australia. Um, so here we are in South Australia, um, just a little bit to the north and west of Adelaide to put it into context. You can see the more detailed map of South Australia on the right here, um, where we have indicated the Barossa Valley, which is actually going to be the majority of what I'm talking about today. Um, but I have included some uh, Eden Valley information as well. So really we're talking about the Barossa zone, which is the sort of pink outline you can see here, the combination of the two. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, just a whole host of old vines here. Um, and I can talk a little bit about why here, as opposed to other places in Australia as we go through. Um, but this is one of the reasons that allows this region of Australia to make some really high quality wines. Um, really just, yeah, outstanding and um, wines that we should all be taking the time to, to look into. So now we know where we are. I know you probably knew already, but just to make sure. Um, let's just have a think about old vines. So if you've done any of the WSET qualifications, you'll uh, probably have heard the term old vine used. Um, and this is an interesting one in terms of um, wine definitions in that it actually doesn't have a legal definition. There is no um, legal age where a vine becomes an old vine. So uh, when you think about how tightly controlled some things are, particularly if you think about the laws in Europe and France, um, France for example, um, it may be a bit of a surprise that we actually don't have a, a number of years allocated to this term. Generally, uh, people would use the term the, the age of 20 years uh, as a kind of a, a good barometer for an old vine. And this is because the vines reach maturity, start to reach maturity at 20 years and the yields will actually start to decrease. So younger vines will produce more fruit uh, and then they kind of go through their teenage years and then at about 20 that, that yield starts to decrease again. 
Um, but obviously, vines can grow a lot older than 20. Um, we'll be looking at vines uh, today that are uh, over 100 years easily. Vines in some places you can find um, up to 200 years. Uh, obviously, not many vines survive that long, um, but it does mean that in terms of old, you know, if you can have old meaning 20 years or 200 years, it's quite a big difference. So it is one of the more ambiguous terms when it comes to wine. Um, well, one of the things I want to think about is why we would keep vines until they get old. If they start to produce lower yields, if they're producing less fruit, there's going to be some advantages to this. Um, so one of the things, we've got a few things listed here, one of the first things I've mentioned is that the vines develop deeper roots. So as the vines get older, their roots will get deeper into the ground. Um, and this means that they have um, more access to a wider availability of nutrients or micronutrients in the soil. Um, it'll also mean that they have um, a greater access to water, which could be more advantageous um, particularly during warmer years where maybe there is less rainfall, they can help um, balance out some of those uh, vintage variations somewhat. Lower yields have mentioned already. Um, often we'll find that grapes from older vines produce wines which have a greater intensity of flavour. Now when we're thinking about what makes a good wine, intensity is often one of the things that we'll look for. So if we have these naturally more intense grapes, that's going to be a benefit. Um, I've put there more expressive of terroir as well. Uh, terroir isn't a very WSET word, I probably should have chosen something else. Um, but the idea that, meaning that the, um, the grapes are uh, expressive of where they're grown. So that kind of connects back to the comment on the deeper roots, getting more into the soils, that's going to be reflected in the flavour of the wine and it's going to make a more unique wine at the end of it. Um, and there are other things as well. We can think about um, things like uh, potentially disease resistance. Some vines will have a greater resistance to um, problems that might be more keenly felt by younger vines. Um, other things in the structure. Um, in fact, I, it was at um, the Henschke Vineyard where you can see the picture here, the Hill of Grace, uh, where they said that they believe that older vines actually produce um, a better tannin structure in the wines as well. So we can see other differences in terms of the taste. Um, so there's a number of different reasons that we'd allow the vines to grow older. Um, of course, there's going to be disadvantages as well. So the older these vines get, um, they are going to require more work, more labour uh, to keep them going. And you do need uh, also a certain amount of skill when it comes to these vines. Um, we'll find later with some of the old, older vineyards um, that they're actually often family owned. So you'll have generations of the same family that have been looking after these vineyards. So the skill that's required to look after these vines has been um, kind of passed down through the generations. Um, but it doesn't mean it's easy. Um, a lot of uh, hand harvesting as well. So that again, an additional point when it comes to labor. Uh, and I've also put lower yields as a disadvantage, um, mainly for more commercial reasons. So we can get these grapes that are much more expressive, more intense, but we get less of them. So commercially, this means that um, you're gonna be able to make less wine. You will charge more money for it. Of course you will. Uh, so it's, it, it is a decision that has to be balanced out there. Um, so it all kind of brings us to the, to the question, are old vines better? Uh, most people would say yes. Yes, for all of the reasons we've talked about already. It may require more work, um, but it's generally believed that the work is worth it. Um, that said, not everyone would agree. Um, I don't think anyone would say that they are not better, that they're worse, but um, some people don't believe that they have as much of an influence um, on the taste of the wine as other people do. So it's an interesting debate. Um, I would say that the majority of wines think that people do make, the majority of people do think they make better wines. So um, it's just something that you'll see 
indicated on labels, sometimes on the front label. In English, we use the term old vine, but in French, you'd see the term bévin, um, or sometimes indicated on the back label instead, where it's maybe not considered the most important information, but it's still put on there somewhere. Um, so, yeah, I think it's important, but then that's why we're here. All right, so when we're talking about old vines, I feel we have to go back into history a little bit and think about where these vines have come from, um, have an understanding of how we've got to this stage. So I'm going to do a little bit of an early history on um, Australia in general, and then focus in on uh, Barossa more specifically. So if we go way, way back, uh, the first vines planted in Australia were in 1788. So these were cuttings of vines brought over by European settlers. Grape vines are not native to Australia. Um, and I think you'll find in, in many countries around the world where European settlers went, they took vines with them. Um, I don't know, maybe you can't be a European settler if you're not going to grow grapes. Who knows? Um, but that's one reason why we have such a spread of um, international varieties around the world. So we have the first vines planted. Um, a few decades later, by the 1820s, we actually see wine being sold as a domestic product. So that then indicates that vines were um, propagated, vineyards were created to make enough wine, enough product, um, that it was available for sale domestically. Um, and then we have here in 1832, James Busby's collection of vines arrives. So James Busby was quite an impressive character uh, when it comes to his, um, what do I want to say, commercial acumen and understanding of the potential of wine in Australia. So he went over to Australia um, in our 1820s as a young man um, emigrating and got there kind of thinking about what he's going to do in terms of his livelihood. Uh, didn't know a thing about wine at this point, um, but kind of recognises that the main product of Australia at that point, which is grains, is not really going to be suited to uh, a kind of long-term business venture. There's actually already a surplus of grains. So he has a thing, he kind of looks at sheep as an alternative, not really going to work there. Um, and then turns his mind to wine production, to vines. Um, but as I said, he didn't know anything about grape growing, about winemaking at this point. Um, so he went and he learned. He went to France and Spain. Um, at this point, there weren't any textbooks. There was no WSET. So he went and he learned from grape growers, winemakers, how it all happened. And while he was doing this, he um, took cuttings of various vines, lots of vines. Um, a lot of the international varieties um, that we think of, things like the Shiraz, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, and so on, um, but also varieties that um, are maybe less internationally recognized, um, things like uh, Trebbiano, more of the neutral varieties as well. So he did this Im impressive collection of work and actually um, wrote a book on it. Um, his treatise on grape growing and winemaking, um, which I would actually encourage you to read if you get a chance, because considering how long ago he wrote it, it's still some of the same information, same theory behind grape growing um, that we teach today. Um, so very interesting stuff. Um, so he basically realised that the land that the grain had been grown on, which was actually quite poor, would be suited to grape growing. He realised that it could grow enough wine to sell it internationally um, and to make a profit on it. So he brought the, the cuttings back to Australia. Um, an important part here is that it is, of course, pre phylloxera cuttings. Um, so no risk of phylloxera um, coming with these vines at this stage. So just to clarify, make sure everyone's clear, phylloxera um, is an aphid that uh, devastated the vineyards of Europe. Um, and it essentially um, lives in the soil and feeds on the roots of vines. So what you'll find in most European vineyards these days is that vines are grafted. They have separate root stocks which can prevent, protect them against the phylloxera. Um, at this time, Australia didn't have any phylloxera. 
Um, since then, some parts of Australia have unfortunately uh, now got vineyards where phylloxera um, is a problem, uh, particularly in Victoria. It's a small but growing problem. Um, but this hasn't spread to everywhere in Australia. So South Australia is still phylloxera free, which is one of the reasons that they have these really old vines, that these vines have managed to survive this long. Um, so all very important things there. Uh, so Burlesby's brought back his collection of vines. Uh, 363 cuttings survived the journey. So, um, you know, he wasn't shy, let's put it that way. Um, so then over the 30s and 40s, we see these vines being um, grown in different places, see them being propagated, experimentation uh, to find out which vine is going to go grow best where according to the climate, according to the soil and so on. Uh, and then by the time we get to the 1870s, we've got many more vineyards planted. So we can see wine growing um, as a commercial, um, a commercial business. At this stage, um, and particularly when we get to the 1890s, um, the style of wine that you would have found is predominantly fortified. So when we think of Australian wine production these days, we largely think of still wine production. But at this time, fortified wines were much more common. And this was largely due to this um, access for an export market. If you think about um, where, where Australia is and where the UK is, for example, is one of the key export markets, um, that's really far away. And so shipping the wines over that distance, they never would have lasted as table wines. So fortified wines were, had much uh, a greater ability to last for the journey wherever their destination may be. So that was uh, part of the reason why they were much more widely produced back then. Um, we still find some lovely Australian fortified wines today. Um, just FYI, if you, if you need to have a look for some. Um, and the other thing that would have been different is um, the grape varieties that were largely being used. So I've put their multi-purpose grapes. Uh, so these, this means grapes that were used for winemaking, but also for just table grapes or for eating uh, for other purposes as well. Uh, so these were not really the kind of high quality varieties that we largely associate with Australia today. Um, I mentioned Trebbiano, but other varieties like um, Duradillo, which don't make wine that's as good, but were more useful for a wider array of purposes. Um, so this would have been, these would have been by far the majority of plantings. Um, if you think to, even by um, a few decades later, it would have been 80 to 90% of grapes planted with these multi-purpose grapes. And it took a long while for that, um, that proportion to shift. So uh, yeah, not quite the wine market that we think of now. Then uh, where have we get to? 1927 to 1939. So uh, this I just thought was quite an interesting fact. By the time um, we get to this point, Australia is actually exporting more wine to the UK than France. Um, admittedly, there have been some uh, issues along the way for France, uh, but quite impressive that Australia has built up this wine trade in that relatively short amount of time. So from here, I wanted to look a little bit more at the history of Barossa specifically. Um, and then as we look into more recent decades, we'll find that there's actually similarities between Barossa and Australia as a whole, so it all kind of comes together. Um, so Barossa as a, as a town was founded in 1836. Um, and by 1846, it was populated by um, Silesian farmers and tradesmen. Uh, so Silesia was a, is a, a kind of a, a term we don't use anymore, obviously, um, but it would have been kind of around Germany uh, where people would have been coming from. Um, and in fact, apparently some people still speak the traditional Silesian um, language around there. It's kind of been passed down or at least a variation of it has been passed down. Um, and uh, apparently to German speakers, it sounds like um, someone speaking kind of ye olde um, language uh, so they can understand what it is, but it's like a language, well, obviously from 
a couple of hundred years ago. Um, anyway, I digress. Back to the wine. Uh, so again, we see this kind of increase. Once the land is settled, we've got these people that understand how to work with the land and how to grow grapes. So we see an increase in the number of vineyards. Um, and quite early on, quality is recognised, the potential for quality is recognised in, vine in vineyards um, in Australia. So uh, the best successes come from vineyards where they are emulating the wines of Europe. And this means the uh, still table wines rather than the fortified wines. This is where the success is coming from. Uh, so Penfolds is a name that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, even at this time, we're winning awards. Uh, as we go on to the 1930s, um, South Australia is singled out as being the kind of key producer for quality wine uh, out of Australia. So 75% of all the wine in Australia is coming from um, South Australia, of which 25% was from Barossa. So and that's pretty huge in terms of uh, amount of production from a small region. And then by um, 19... 51, uh, we have the first vintage of Penfolds Grange. Um, so this is one of the icon wines of Australia now. Um, and this was again, a kind of a wine inspired by the vineyards of Europe. So this focus on premium table wines made from the high quality grapes. We're not looking at those multi-purpose grapes now. Um, and creating wines that are expressive of the land and uh, varieties that we know, but wines that are different to what we'd get from France and elsewhere, but of a very similar quality. So this was pretty impressive at the time. Um, and soon after we heard other examples um, from vineyards in the region, um, like Hen Henschke in 1952, released their Mount Edelston, uh, followed a few years later by their Hill of Grace, uh, and another lovely picture of Hill of Grace you can see here. Um, so we're seeing this kind of um, recognition of quality and um, this effort to, to push boundaries on stars of wine and make Australian wine, um, make people recognise the quality of Australian wine and the potential of it. So, um, so far, so good, right? So, you know, we've got a lot of grapes, making a lot of wine, the wine's really good. Um, but it doesn't mean that there, was, um, it, there were no bumps along the road. So when we get into later decades, we can see there's actually a little bit more uh, variation, more things uh, going on, and it's not all good. So we go from the 50s, we've seen that um, we're getting some really high quality wines produced. Um, and in the 60s, as global markets open up, um, we see more of a change towards table wines. So less fortified wines being produced is the still table wines uh, from, again, the international varieties, the, the grapes that can produce this high quality. Um, and then we get to the 1970s. Um, and while the trend for table wines um, it still continues, what Barossa has been producing up to this point is a lot of red wine. If you think about where Barossa is, it's a warm climate, we get a lot of Shiraz and Grenache and Mouvedre and so on. Um, great for red wines, not quite so much white wine being produced. So as the global trend changes towards more white wine, there's not so much demand for the black grapes that have been grown here. And in fact, at this point, we're looking at a lot of the um, wine production is done by quite big companies. So these companies have contracts with all the small grape growers throughout the region, and these grape growers essentially rely on these companies to buy their grapes and that's how they make their living. But as these big companies realize that they're not going to be able to sell these wines, they do not honor the contracts with these small growers. So these growers are now left with grapes that they can't sell and the possibility of losing their business. Uh, as you know, with grape growing, you get one chance a year. So if you can't do anything with your grapes in one chance a year, that does very much put a strain on your business. Um, but there was help, fortunately. Peter Lehman, um, who is uh, a young winemaker at the time, probably a name that you're familiar with. His um, name now is um, a, a brand of wine from Australia uh, based on the company that he started. 
So he essentially takes a loan out, leaves the company that he's, he's working for um, and promises to help these small growers, buys the grapes off them that they, they couldn't sell otherwise and makes wine with them. So this was, you know, this was essential to the survival of various producers in this region. Um, so important information there. Um, 1980s, doesn't, doesn't get much better, to be honest. Um, so we're still having problems with surplus of grapes. While Peter Lehman's been doing good work there, um, the government decides to initiate a vine pool scheme. So it essentially is going to pay um, vineyard owners to pull up their vines um, and then change the use of their land because we're, we're seeing just too much of a surplus of grape production. Um, and if you look at, think about where we are in the 1980s, some of these wines are already over 100 years old. You're looking at some really important land, important vines, and you know growers who have had a bit of a time of it recently were some of them just ready to give up. And I'm sure you can all understand that. Um, but several people followed Peter Lehman's kind of original scheme. They started um, creating contracts with these smaller producers, encouraging them not to pull up their vines, encouraging them to um, keep working on them, paying them for their grapes, of course, in order that the, um, these, these old vines, the, the quality of these vines can be preserved. Um, unfortunately, many of them did take up these offers, not all of them, so there will still have been some old vineyards that were lost, um, but it preserved many more that could have been lost. And so this really changed the structure of the region, uh, commercial structure of the region, from where it had previously been operated by, as I said, a few big companies which had lots of contracts with um, lots of growers. We're now seeing the development of smaller co um, companies which have contracts with a few growers, um, but which have an ability to honour those contracts and ensure that the um, grape growers are not only getting paid, um, but are getting paid well. Um, so by the time we get into the 1990s, grape growers are actually getting a, a fair wage for the grapes that they're growing. Many of these, as I've said, which take more work, which take more skill to manage. Um, and fortunately, by the 1990s, we do see a demand internationally rise. So that's the other thing that helps as um, fashions change again. I mean, you know, fashions in wine can change quite quickly. Um, people look back to Australia for the, for the styles of wine that they're making there, um, understand the quality of wines, and that um, then, again, increases demand. So we're back on the up for a while um, until we get to the 2000s, where, once again, there's a dip. Um, so the reduction in demand, um, again, causes some problems, um, but it does mean that the focus is on the higher quality wines. So this commitment to keeping these old vines, keeping these high quality vineyards to the integrity of the region and to this idea of provenance of making sure that these wines have a story to tell and that that is um, communicated through the wine and through the entire industry. Um, fortunately, again, the market's changed. So by the time we get to the, uh, the 2010s, um, Demand has increased once again. I told you a bit of a roller coaster. Um, but this time it's largely due to um, different markets opening up. So here it's um, a lot down to um, wine consumption in Asia having increased uh, dramatically. So uh, Australia's proximity to many Asian countries has helped them get a foothold in that market. And again, due to the quality that I've already mentioned, these wines become really popular here as well. Um, so yeah, not, not an easy journey by any respect, uh, but I think that makes it all the more impressive for the vines that have survived to this point um, to, to, to have done. The, the effort, the work, the commitment by generations of people uh, makes these things, you know, truly special. All right, so that's the, um, the history lesson over. Um, so next I wanted to talk uh, about how Barossa is trying to protect its old vines. And one of the ways they're doing this is through the old vine charter. 
So I mentioned earlier that Australia, uh, not Australia, the world doesn't have a legal definition of what is an old vine. But because Australia has so many old vines and because they go beyond what's normally considered old, they've created this charter um, to categorise vines, but also to record and preserve them. So they now are able to, they've, they've got a record of where these old vines are, how old they are. Um, so this is something that we can make sure we use as a resource and that they have access to these old vines um, for generations, hopefully, to come. Um, so again, it, it's not a legally de uh, defined framework, but it gives you an, a, a few different terms that are used to describe vines of different ages. So you can see them here. So at 35 or more years, this is where we're calling the vines old vines. So forget that in some countries they say 20 years, we're nearly double that. So to be an old vine, you have to be at least 35 years or more. So by this time, we're going to have vines that are fully mature. They're going to have the thick trunk, deep root systems, um, and they're going to show that concentration of flavour that we expect from old vines. So already we're looking at wines that we expect to be high quality. The next step up are 70 plus year old vines, survivor vines. Survived not least um, some of the problems of the more recent decades. So at 70 year old vines we're showing, we're seeing um, more intensity, more quality, more structure again. So we're just moving kind of up a notch in terms of the flavours of the wines. Um, so here, again, it, it shows a commitment to the vines, a commitment to keeping these vines um, in good health for that amount of time. Uh, but obviously we've still got a way to go. So the next step up, we've got the centenarian vines. So these are vines that are 100 years or more old. Um, so here we're looking at vines that are um, going to give particularly low yields. If you see them in the vineyards, they have those kind of particularly thick, gnarled trunks. Um, we'll often have, um, with these vines and the ancestor vines, in fact, um, you'll often find that they were originally dry farmed. Um, so that means that initial plantings of the vines won't have been um, uh, won't, won't have had water added to them. So it's, it's a choice for winemakers these days, but many producers prefer, uh, prefer not to irrigate, prefer not to add water because they believe it and gives more to the uh, natural character of the wine. So that's how many of these vines would be started. Um, and uh, as with all of these vines, we're looking at uh, Phylloxera free. Um, now, with the centenarian vines and the ancestor vines, part of the reason they have survived so long is not just the, um, the work of the people, but it's also having that right combination of vine and uh, vineyard area. So it's the right soil, you've got all the things that you need there for the vine to survive this long. So it's, it's, it's a, a combination of the two things. You can't just plunk a vine in anywhere and look after it and hope that it all lasts to 100 years. That won't necessarily happen. Um, so then our final category is ancestor vines. So as you can see, these are vines that are 125 years or more old. Um, so these are essentially vines that have been around um, since the original settlers of Barossa. So these have survived all the ups and downs, all of that roller coaster, and continue to produce fruit that is to this day still used in wine production. So again, very low yielding, um, often dry farmed. And again, that combination of um, the vineyard, the soil and the um, grape variety, but also here the grape growers. Um, vineyards that have been in production since those first settlers, but also families that have looked after these vines uh, sometimes for that duration of time. So we can be looking at family grape growers that are in their fifth, sixth, seventh generation now of working with these vines in these areas and looking after them. So that is an expertise which, um, which can't be really and not everywhere is going to have that, that access to that knowledge and experience. Um, so yeah, old is not, uh, not just old. 
anymore. Now, following on from this, um, I've actually pulled up a few figures. Um, these I have gained from uh, the Australian Wine Discovered website. I've um, kind of combined them um, from a couple of different tables there. Um, by the way, the Australian Wine Discovered website is a great resource if you have any interest in Australian wine. Um, do check that out. Um, but what it shows here is just the uh, area under vine for different varieties according to their age. Um, now, I'm not a person that's massively big on figures or numbers, um, but it's just quite interesting um, to see what we've got. So um, a lot of different varieties have these ancestor vines. Remember this being over 125 years. Obviously not huge amounts of land dedicated to them, um, but potentially more than you'd expect. Um, Shiraz obviously has uh, a lot of um, all different ages. Shiraz, um, because it's the most widely planted variety um, in Barossa. Um, and you can see, particularly in the centenarian vines here, quite a lot have managed to survive from that time onwards. Um, so one thing that might surprise you is just the number of different grape varieties that have vines that are this old. Sure, I'd say Shiraz to you and you go, yeah, of course Shiraz has vines that are that old. Grenache and Mouvedre, you might go, okay, I wasn't, wasn't expecting that, but that makes sense. Cabernet Sauvignon, maybe not. I mean, obviously not loads that are reaching that, those really old stages. Um, but then Riesling and Semillon, yeah, some of these grape varieties have been around a really long time. Um, Riesling, you can see, has had a big bump over recent years. Um, and that'll be more in the Eden Valley part um, of the Barossa zone rather than the Barossa Valley, um, just to clarify. Uh, we've got figures included from both here. Um, but all in all, what this shows to me is a picture of a lot of old vines. Um, so a, a very important resource for this area. Um, and then in terms of the wines, so of course, we know that there's a lot of old wines there, um, but I just wanted to give you some examples of wines that use these old vines. Um, it's not going to be always easy to tell. Um, so many vineyards will use their older vines in with younger vines, so they won't necessarily be able to label them as you know, all from one vineyard, which is all 125 plus year old vines, because there'll be bits from other vineyards that are younger as well. Um, but these are, uh, again, not an exhaustive list, um, just a, a, a few examples that I wanted to pick out. Um, so we can see we've got um, Grenache from 1850, um, the Shiraz from 1843, the Langmar Freedom Shiraz, Penfolds, couple of decades later with their 1888 Cabernet, uh, the Hewitson Old Garden Mouvedre. Um, Riesling, not quite so old. I mean, it's still pretty old, um, but when you're talking about you know, nearly 100 years difference here, 1961, phew, um, no, not phew, uh, the, the Pusey Vale Contours Riesling is an outstanding wine as well. Um, and I thought I'd just put in a nice little picture of Pusey Vale for you here too. Um, so these are wines that are all commercially available and obviously they're a little bit more expensive than your, your everyday wines. Um, but, you know, what you're getting here is wines that are very high quality and wines that have history to them. You know, you're looking at vi vineyards that have been planted by generations, wines that have been looked after for, for a huge amount of time. So when you're tasting these wines, you're tasting kind, almost the history of them. Yeah, maybe that's getting a little bit um, beyond the more kind of sensible points I wanted to make here. But um, when we think about wine, we do often have this kind of romantic notion to it. And I think the, the history in the case of these wines really has to come into it. You're, you know, you're looking into the, the past. You have this um, really important um, ability with these wines, which you don't necessarily get everywhere else. Um, so you've got a few examples there. Um, next, I just wanted to mention 
that it's not just Barossa in Australia um, that has particularly old vines. There's actually lots of other places as well. Um, so I'll pick up on a few other vineyard, uh, other areas that have some particularly old vines too. Because um, remember, when you know those cuttings came back with James Busby in the 1830s, they were moved around the country. So lots of other places will have been starting to plant vineyards at a similar time. So by no means um, is the old vine production exclusive to Barossa. Uh, so you can see again, a few examples, not an exhaustive list. Uh, so Hunter Valley, Shiraz there, planted 1880. Um, also, um, a couple of other varieties there, but Shiraz, um, I believe, takes the, uh, the lead when it comes to the oldest planting. Uh, in Langhorn Creek, we've got Cabernet Sauvignon from 1881. In Clare Valley, um, just further north compared to Barossa, we've got Shiraz from 1883. Um, and then the slightly more unusual one, which I quite like, is Marsan from 1927 in the Gambi Lakes. Um, yeah. Not many other places going with Marsan as their oldest grape variety. Um, well, why not? Makes a difference. Shiraz and a lot of other places, eh? Um, so yeah, uh, lots of these vineyards, again, won't necessarily tell you the dates on the labels, but um, if you're interested and you look into it, you can find um, wines where uh, fruit from these old vineyards is used, probably in conjunction with um, slightly younger vineyards, but it, you know, it's all gonna contribute to the style of the wine. Um, so here I just wanted to really think about what, what, we're gonna, what we can expect from these old vines to come um, and how these old vines are going to survive the future. So we've mentioned already how important the growers are here. So um, yeah, we're seeing some families in their seventh generation. Um, you know, are we going to continue to see this growing eighth, ninth and onwards? Hopefully, yes, but you've also got to imagine how generational changes are going to influence um, people's ability to carry on working on these vineyards. You know, the, the kids these days don't necessarily want to stay in there and work on the farm where their dad works, so they might move off to the city. Um, and you can see it become more challenging for these growers to maintain that continuity. And of course, there's going to be opportunities to work with other people and, and pass that knowledge, pass that skill on. Um, but it is, yeah, it is part of the kind of romanticism of the, of the idea of these old vines that they've been looked after by the same families for so long. Um, and that sort of connects to the next point which I wanted to make, is that these, these growers, whether they're family owned or not, they're the custodians of these vineyards. They don't, you know, they don't own them, they look after them. They work with them, they preserve them for the next generation to come. Um, and this was a term that was used by um, one of the grape growers I met in, in Pusyville when I was there several years ago. And it was one of the things that it just created that sensation to me that the value of these vines is really understood. That while we're working with them now, and yes, they're important and they, you know, we're making our business, our money from them, uh, we want to make sure that they're preserved for generations to come so that people can continue to enjoy these wines um, and continue to en enjoy the development of the vines as they get older and how they change and how the wines change as a result of them. So, yeah, I guess it's, it's not really taken for granted at all, the age of these vineyards, um, the age of the vines and the important resource that these are. Um, now, of course, it's not um, completely easy, we've said that already. Keeping phylloxera at bay, I mean, how do you do that? It's, it's, that's um, that's going to be a continual challenge. Um, there is a phylloxera in Australia now, while you know everything is being done to prevent its spread. Um, you know, we're, we're a global economy now, a global um, society. So it's not impossible that somehow, by accident, you know, someone would manage to transport phylloxera through here. So that's going to be, um, yeah, a, a worry. Uh, so, you know, so far we're okay. Uh, let's hope that it stays that way for as long as possible. Um, and while phylloxera is a problem, it's not the only problem. 
Um, so there are other diseases that can affect vines. Um, and so we've still got to be trying to make sure that the, the vines are in the best health possible. Um, again, some of these, there's not much you can do to avoid. Um, some, you know, no one wants diseases in their vineyards. But the, again, this comes back to the skill of the grape growers and, and the more they're able to um, try and prevent these or try and um, work with vines if they do succumb to any diseases, that's how we're going to keep preserving these, uh, these vines and making sure that they continue to produce for years to come. Um, the last point I put here is just making the world aware. Um, so, you know, these are seriously old vines. And as I said at the start, I had no idea that we've got some of the oldest Shiraz vines in the world in this part of Australia. Not just oldest Shiraz vines, oldest Grenache vines, Mouvedre vines, and so on. Um, so helping people understand that these vines exist, then what it means to be a vine that this old, how that they've got to this point, and of course, how the wine tastes, why we should care about um, wines made from particularly old vines, that's going to be key to ensuring that these companies you know, continue to sell their wines from these old vines for a price that's fair for both the winemakers and the grape growers that have looked after them for this long um, and ensure that we can continue to keep this, uh, this tradition going for hopefully many more generations to come. So this is where you come into play. Um, now that, you know, you're aware of all of the work, all of the, the troubles that these grape growers have had to go through, um, do go out and try something, see what you can find, tell your friends about it, make sure everyone has an understanding of just how important these are. So I wanted to um, finish up just with a few resources, partly that I've used uh, for this presentation if you're interested in Australian vines in particular, and then a few more other general old vine uh, resources. Um, so Australian Wine Discovered, I've mentioned already, this is uh, an amazing resource by Wines of Australia, the promotional body for Australian wine, um, which has pretty much everything you ever wanted to know about Australian wine. So if you're interested, have a look in there. It covers all different regions, all different topics, different great varieties. There's lots for you to sink your teeth into. Um, if you want to know more on Barossa in particular, um, there's a, an independent website for Barossa Wine as well. Um, the book by James Busby, um, our um, intrepid chap who uh, essentially started cultivation of, of the vine, uh, well, the commercial cultivation of vine in Australia. Um, his book from 1825, um, you can get and read through. Uh, obviously, language-wise, not the easiest read, but information, really interesting. As I said, links um, quite closely to a lot of our WSUT materials that we'd use today. Uh, and then if you're interested in old vines more widely, um, Jancis Robinson um, has an old vine register where they've started, uh, they have a, um, a list of different old vines from around the world, from different uh, vineyards, including the age of the vines um, and lots of different information. So that's quite a good document to look at. Um, and then as much as we've uh, focused on the Barossa old vines and the old vine charter, um, there are actually other projects in vineyards around the world, uh, countries around the world that have started doing similar. So you can see an example from South Africa here, an example from California too. Now you may look at that and wonder, well, hang on a minute, why is it all the new world regions that are making such a big deal of their old vines? Um, and part of the answer to that may be the term new world. Um, we're not, we're not so new anymore. Um, lots of uh, long history of winemaking here. So uh, maybe that's just helping to reinforce this thing that a lot of us already know um, that yeah, there's, there's very old vines in many of these countries. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, got a little bit of time left for some questions. 
so I'll just pull up the chat and see what's what's going on. There's been a lot of messages. Um, if you do have a question, um, feel free to type it in. Um, question, how long will the online webinars continue? As long as we can. Um, we're making plans for the next few weeks, so they will continue through July. Um, and that's about as much as I can tell you at the moment. Everyone's jealous of my prize. Excellent. Ah, so yeah, uh, hopefully you've got an uh, answer the question on the old vine charter. Uh, James Busby was Scottish, I believe. Yeah. I think some of these I've answered as we go along. Does Australia have any native grape varieties? No. Do the bushfires affect the old vines? Um, not kind of specifically. Um, obviously, the bushfires did have an effect on um, on quite a few vineyards, um, but proportionally compared to the overall vineyard area, it was actually quite a small number um, that suffered any damage. So, not as I'm as far as I'm aware, nothing containing this particularly old um, material was wiped out. So fortunate there but um yeah it did have an impact okay looks like that might be ah oh, someone's asked the french term that i mentioned for old vines i'm going to type that into the chat just because um my pronunci oh because my spelling going to be any better hmm Go okay, something like that. Um, they been. All right, I'm going to end the recording here just while I'm looking through the rest of the questions. <laughs>